implied threat of killing me if I did not sign the paper he demanded terrified me, especially as I saw he was working himself up to the highest possible pitch of passion, and instinct told me that any reply other than one of seeming concession to his demands would only be fuel to a raging fire. So I replied, Well, if I've got to sign... And then I paused some time, resuming, I said, But, Mr. Winters, you are greatly excited. Besides, I see you are laboring under a total misapprehension. <coughs> it is your duty not to inflame, but to calm yourself. I am prepared to show you, if you will only point out the article that you allude to, that you regard as charges, what no calm and logical mind has any right to regard as such. Show me the charges, and I will try at all events, and if it becomes plain that no charges have been preferred, then plainly there can be nothing to retract, and no one should rightly urge you to demand a retraction. You should beware of making so serious a mistake. For a, however a honest a man may be, every one is liable to misapprehend. Besides, you assume that I am the author of some certain article which you have not pointed out. It is hasty to do so. He then pointed to some numbered paragraphs in a Tribune article headed, What's the matter with Yellow Jacket? Saying, that's what I refer to. To gain time for general reflection and resolution, I took up the paper and looked, at, looked it over for a while, he remaining silent, and as I hoped, cooling. I then reassumed, saying, as I supposed, I do not admit having written that article, nor have you any right to assume so important a point, and then base important action upon your assumption. You might deeply regret it afterwards. In my published address to the people, I notified the world that no information as to the authorship of any article would be given without the consent of the writer. I therefore cannot honorably tell you who wrote that article, nor can you exact it. If you are not the author, then I do demand to know who is. I must decline to say. Then, by blank, I brand you as its author, and shall treat you accordingly. Passing that point, the most important misapprehension which I notice is that you regard them as charges at all, when their context, both at their beginning and end, show they are not. These winter words introduce them. Such an investigation, <coughs> just before indicated, we think might result in showing some of the following points. <coughs> then follow eleven specifications, and the succeeding paragraph shows that the suggested investigation might exonerate those who are generally believed guilty. You see, therefore, the context proves they are not preferred as charges. And this you seem to have overlooked. While making these comments, Mr. Winters frequently interrupted me in such a way as to convince me that he was resolved not to consider candidly the thoughts contained in my words. He insisted upon it that they were charges, and by blank he would make me take them back as charges. And he referred the question to Philip Lynch, to whom I then appealed as a literary man, as a logician, and as an editor, calling his attention especially to the introductory paragraph just before the quoted. He replied, if they are not charges, then they certainly are insinuations, whereupon Mr. Winters renewed his demands for retract and retraction, precisely such as he had before named, except that he would allow me to state who did write the article if I did not myself, and this time shaking his fist in my face with more cursings and epitaphs. When he threatened me with his clenched fist, instinctively I tried to rise from my chair, but Winters then forcibly thrust me down, as he did every other time, at least seven or eight, when under similar imminent danger of bursting, bruising, by his fist, or for aught I could know worse than that after the first stunning blow, which he could easily and safely to himself have dealt me so long as he kept me down and stood over me. This fact it was, 
which more than anything else convinced me that by plan and plot I was purposely made powerless in Mr. Winter's hands, and that he did not mean to allow me the, that advantage of being afoot which he possessed. Moreover, I then became convinced that Philip Lynch, and for what reason, I wondered, would, be abs would do absolutely nothing to protect me in his own house. I realized that the situation, then the situation thoroughly, I had found it equally vain to protest or argue, and I would make no unmanly appeal for pity, still less apologize. Yet my life had been by the, the plainest possible implication threatened. I was a weak man. I was unarmed. I was helplessly down, and Winters was afoot and probably armed. Lynch was the only, quote, witness. The statements demanded, if given and not explained, would utterly sink me in my own self-respect, in my family's eyes, and in the eyes of the community. On the other hand, should I give the author's name, how could I ever expect the confidence of the people which I should no longer deserve? And how much dearer to me and to my family was my life than the life of the real author to his friends? Yet life seemed dear, and each minute that remained seemed precious, if not solemn. I sincerely trust that neither you nor any of your readers, and especially none with families, may ever be placed in such seeming direct proximity to death, while obliged to decide the one question I was compelled to, viz., what should I do? I, a man of family, and not, as Mr. Winters is, quote, alone. Unquote. The reader is requested not to skip the following MT. Strategy and Mesmerism To gain time for further reflection and hoping that by a seeming acquiescence I might regain my personal liberty at least till I could give an alarm or take advantage of some momentary inadvertence of winter's and then, without a cowardly flight escape, I resolved to write a certain kind of retraction, but previously, previously had inwardly decided. First, that I would studiously avoid every action which might be construed into the drawing of a weapon, even by a self-infuriated man, no matter what amount of insult might be heaped upon me, for it seemed to me that this great excess of compound profanity, foulness, and epitaph must be more than a mere indulgence and therefore must have some object. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Therefore, as before, without thought, I thereafter by intent kept my hands away from my pockets and generally in sight and spread upon my knees. Second, I resolved to make no motion with my arms or hands which could possibly be construed into aggression. Third, I resolved to make no motion with my arm. Now, I resolved completely to govern my outward manner and suppress indignation. To do this, I must govern my spirit. To do that by force of imagination, I was obliged, like actors on the boards, to resolve myself into an unnatural mental state and see all things through the eyes of an assumed character. Fourth, I resolved to try on Winters, silently and unconsciously to himself, a mesmeric power which I possess over certain kinds of people, and which at times I have found to work even in the dark over the lower animals. Does anyone smile at these last accounts? God save you for ever being obliged to beat in a game of chess whose stake is your life, you having but four poor pawns and pieces and your adversary with his full force unshorn. But if you are provided you have any strength with breadth of will, do not despair. Though mesmeric power may not save you, it may help you. Try it at all events. In this instance I was conscious of power coming into me, and by a law of nature I know Winters was correspondingly weakened. If I could have gained more time, I am sure he would not ever have struck me. It takes time both to form such resolutions and to recite them. 
That time, however, I gained while thinking of my retraction, which I first wrote in pencil, alerting it from time to time till I got it to suit me, my aim being to make it like, look like a concession of demands, while in fact it should tersely speak the truth into Mr. Winter's mind. When it was finished, I copied it in ink, and if correctly copied from my first draft, it should read as follows. In copying, I do not think I made any material change. Copy. To Philip Lynch, editor of the Gold Hill News, I learn that General John 